I mean, you see somebody doing something and you think that, well, if they're doing something and they're getting these results, which may be real or perceived by you, you have no idea, really, unless you really dig into somebody's operation, which who has the time for that? Because we barely have the time to do what we do for our own <laughs> operations. So, um, but if you let it, it will dictate your management decisions because um, you, you you see what they're doing and you want to try and apply that on your place. Um, but there's so much context missing. Hey folks, this episode is brought to you in part by the Red Angus Association of America. Let's hear how they can help you with your heifer selection process. The cow. No wonder they call her the foundation female. On her shoulders rests the genetic basis of any cow herd, so it's critical she measures up to your expectations for stability and fertility. How can you create more high quality females while eliminating the guesswork and upfront costs that accompany heifer development? The Red Angus Association of America has launched Red Choice, a program designed to aid producers in developing the highest quality heifers through genomic testing, AI technology, technology, and veterinarian partnerships. Heifers that meet the criteria are more likely to stay in the herd, propagate the best genetics, and make a positive impact on your bottom line. Learn more about Red Choice at redangus.org. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversation podcast where we talk about all things related to ranching by connecting you to peer ranchers and industry leaders to improve the profitability of your operation and your lifestyle. Now, if you are looking for a community of ranchers, sign up for my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are mastermind events for ranchers. You join a Zoom link and you sit down and have a conversation with other ranchers and industry leaders about specific topics that help you improve your operation and face the challenges that we face as an industry as a whole. Now, if you want immediate ranch management advice, go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter and sign up. When you sign up, I will send you a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the ranching gurus who have been on my show and poured out their knowledge for all to hear. With that, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram by following Cattle Convos. You can connect with me there, or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com to find anything you may need. I'm excited to meet you. Okay, Jason, well, I'm really excited to have you on the show, one, because I've been following your podcast for a long time, and two, Um, the mental health conversation is something that is important to me and you talk about it a lot. And I mean, that's really your whole platform, a lot of it. So I'm excited to have you on here. So thanks for joining me today. Oh, thanks for, thanks for inviting me on. I appreciate any time I get to chat and especially with a fellow podcaster. (laughs) Well, awesome. So we're really going to focus on comparison syndrome today because I saw Mm -hmm. you made a post about it and when you made that post I thought about it and I was like you know that's something a lot of people need to remind themselves in here but before we dive into that conversation can you talk about what your role in agriculture looks like today and maybe a little bit about what you discuss on your podcast for maybe those who aren't familiar yeah so I mean as far as my role in agriculture uh I have about um, about a 200 head cow calf operation. Um, my dad was actually, my dad owned the local livestock market for, uh, a number of years. He sold it when I was a kid, but he still, uh, was involved. He still had a cow, large sites, cow calf operation, especially for our part of the country. Um, I'm in, uh, the Ozarks of Missouri. So the no- Northern Ozarks, um, about halfway between Springfield and St. Louis, um, so as far as like what my day to day looks like with it, um, like I said, we, we have, oh, we have twice a year in the spring and fall and then mostly sell most of our calves at market. I keep a few for custom, 
uh, freezer beef. And then uh, I background all my heifers as well. So uh, I don't take in a whole lot of outside cattle. I did for the first time actually last year, took in some outside cattle and uh, it was, it was an okay experience. I'll probably, it's something, I don't know this year with the way prices, I don't know if I want to pay that much on the front end this year <laughs> for them. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's been a really, um, I, I really enjoy it's I'm, agriculture and especially the cattle industry is something that I am super passionate about because, um, it's, it's given me so much. Well, that is great to hear and kind of a common theme on the show. So do you have um, other roles outside of your ranch and your cow-calf operation? I mean, I mean, yes. you probably have a lot, but how, what about kind of careers or even talk about your yeah. podcast a little bit briefly? Like- yeah, sure. So, so um, I'm actually, I'm in transition from... Um, at this time of the day is my drive time home from work. Uh, I am, I work 40 hours a week as a pharmacist. So um, that's a, that's a, obviously it's a big part of what I do. I mean, that's what, uh, it's my main source of income. Um, but also, uh, you know, also I have the podcast, which uh, you asked me to speak about a little bit. And uh, that's the podcast is where I kind of bring all of my lives together with agriculture, healthcare, um, the importance of having a strong family home, um, all of that really comes together. And I talk about pretty much anything I do in the rest of my life. That's where I talk about it is on the podcast and in a number of different forms. You know, a lot of the talk has been mental health, but it's, uh, you know, having a, having a strong home life, strong faith foundation, uh, all just, it's a, just a great big kind of amalgam of things. Well, it's, it's good to listen to, and I appreciate you talking about that. So kind of diving into today's topic, how do you define comparison syndrome? Yeah. So, and it's something that, I mean, for me, myself, it's something I struggle with mightily. And I think a lot of, a lot of farmers and ranchers do. Um, To me, it's just, you're always measuring up how you how you compare i mean not to use a a cyclical definition but you know how you stack up how you match up how your uh, operations look in comparison to somebody and now thanks to social media it doesn't have to even be your neighbors it has to be it can be people from anywhere anybody you see on social media and you look at you look at what you have and you compare it to what everybody else has and it's a huge it can be a huge source of internal stress because you you have your whole story but you just have a fragment of somebody else's story and you have no idea what the day-to-day goes through of anybody and um i i have yet to meet anybody who i would trade problems with you know what I mean? So like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with my problems and I, I can handle them, but like you give me somebody else. So but I think that's what you have to really think about is when you start talking about comparison syndrome is yeah, that theirs may look shinier, nicer, prettier. Um, but what, what's behind the scenes? What do you not see? And like I said, I, I've yet to meet someone I would trade problems with. I think that's a really good point to bring up, and especially on the social media front, because it is phenomenal that, you know, farming, ranching, agriculture, that it can be shared on social media, but it is really easy to get caught up in saying, oh, well, so-and-so was able to get this new piece of equipment or look at what management practice they're doing. And, but like you said, you also don't know what problems they're facing underneath the surface because right as I talk to more people who are podcasting or social media influencers or just day-to-day people I get caught up in that too but then if they open up and talk about their problems you're right I wouldn't want their problems (laughs) so I'll keep mine yeah and that's that's what you the way you have to look at it like and, and again I think it you I said it already but I think it's really important you have your 
you have your full story and very rarely do you have everybody else's full story or someone else's full story. So do you view comparison syndrome and imposter syndrome separately or do you think they tie into each other? So, you know, and I, you asked me this question when you, when we talked to discuss what we were going to talk about and, and I don't really have a good answer um, because I think either way you look, you can look at it the way they're different and the same. Um, I think they're probably bred out of the same type. Uh, you know, imposter syndrome is you thinking that you don't belong or you don't think you um, are, are as good as somebody may perceive you to being mm-hmm. like you are you're you're actually really incompetent but people view you as being totally competent in something whereas with comparison syndrome i don't think competency is ever really uh uh something that is i mean it can be questioned but um it's a re- i think i think when you get into comparison you look at here's what i have versus what they have and when you talk about imposter syndrome, it's really what you don't have, I feel like, or like what you feel like you don't have. And you know, it's a, I'm not sure it's like a thing that you can really like, well, this is this versus this, like that you can really totally separate them. But, you know, I think there, there are some distinct things that make them different. Okay. So, you know, you mentioned that you face comparison syndrome yourself along with many other ranchers. How do you see that impacting you as you go about managing your ranch? Does it impact you when you try and make decisions? Sure. Like, I mean, you see somebody doing something and you think that, well, if they're doing something and they're getting these results, which may be real or perceived by you. You have no idea, really, unless you really dig into somebody's operation, which who has the time for that? Because we barely have the time to do what we do for our own <laughs> operations. So, um, but if you let it, it will dictate your management decisions because um, you, you, you see what they're doing and you want to try and apply that on your place. Um, but there's so much context missing so much context and I know that for me like that's a big part of for me I would like to be more have a more mindful grazing operation right uh that's something that I I really something I fail at that I really like that would be so if I could say one thing I would be able to improve on to improve my overall operation would be my grazing um but as we were talking about, I, right now in my life, I don't really have the time to devote to that. I mean, we all have time for what's important to us. You know, I think that's a really important thing. I don't have anything I'm willing to give up right now, the way my life is, to make those huge improvements yet. I mean, someday, yes. So, I mean, we have to, we all have to have a life and have an operation that serves our lifestyle, whatever that lifestyle may be. And I think that's a huge part of the sustainability discussion that's not ever really talked about is, you know, is it sustainable to keep doing things the way you're doing them as far as from a, from a, a, a mental and emotional aspect? Um I know for a long time we were uh, we were putting in all kinds of inputs and we were getting really big, heavy weaning weights and calves. But um, and I found out that being able to step back and kind of let cows do things a little bit more naturally, not put the inputs into them as as much as I once did. That's a really sustainable way of me doing things because uh, I don't put a lot of input as far as dollars into them. Um, sure they don't wean as heavy um, but I, I, my enjoyment out of it is is much better and I think that's what again enjoyment is something you better enjoy it or else you're not going to want to keep who wants to keep doing something that they don't enjoy so you have to do things in a way 
where you can enjoy them. And me, and I, I'll say I do. I have an outside source of income, um, but I really try hard, really hard not to subsidize the cattle, uh, my, my cattle business. Um, so sometimes I supplement it, sure, but like I, I try to not make decisions that are subs uh, like that I'm subsidizing it and paying, paying for something that it couldn't upheld on its own. Um, and I, I think a lot of people, and I, I'm guilty of of not, not staying true to that always. Um, but but yeah, trying to just let it be, let it take care of itself as much as possible. Let nature do its work as much as possible. Hey folks, let's hear from our friends at Neogen. You are working to preserve the ground for the next generation. Shouldn't your cow herd be built for the future too? Neogen is the industry leader in beef cattle genomic testing. They are proud to have brought the first genomic profile to the market, and this is called Igenity Beef. Igenity Beef is a genomic test that provides commercial cattle producers easy to understand data to make genomic selections to advance their herd with each generation. Igenity Beef is designed for crossbred commercial cattle, utilizing the herd's very own DNA to predict genetic merit in your herd. Igenity Beef provides 17 critical traits on a 1 through 10 scale that aids in selection and management of commercial females and provide marketing opportunities to build your herd for the next generation. To learn more about how Igenity Beef can aid you in selection, management, and marketing opportunities of each calf crop and your herd, go to neogen.com or call 877-443-6489. Again, that is neogen.com. I think you're the first person who I've ever heard tie into like the health side of sustainability. Like, is your operation sustainable for you from a health standpoint? I don't think I've ever heard that tied into it. I've heard it from an entrepreneur perspective and a business perspective, which ranches our businesses, but we mm-hmm. still are so bad about reminding ourselves of that. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, I really think it's a, it's, to me, it's the biggest part of it. Like the personal human health side of it is the most important side. Um, it's, you have to enjoy it. And, and I, I know like a lot of times ranchers especially are really, they're really bad about glorifying the hard parts and like wearing the hard stuff as a badge of honor. And I, again, that's not a sustainable way of living. You know, I, I heard Dave Pratt say that one time, Dave Pratt is the uh, former owner of ranch management consultants who they put on the ranching for profit um, schools. And, and he said, you, they, they we would talk about people who like, well, I've went 14 years without a vacation and been here all this. We don't take any time off. And like, you know, how sad is that? Like, how sad is it that uh, it is if you were to leave for any sort of time or to take any time away from it, that it would all crumble apart? Uh, that that is the def- definition of of insustainability. It is. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot more to sustainability than just what we've talked about before. So kind of shifting gears, you know. So say ranchers have already fallen into this comparison syndrome. uh, I don't want to say supposedly, like as humans, we all naturally compare. I mean, sure. Right. Of course. I mean, how many times were you told to compare and contrast in elementary school? Like comparison is just a part of us. So if, you know, we are in this comparison syndrome stage, you know, what are some suggestions you have to kind of be more mindful and pull ourselves out of that? So I always, I use this example. I use this in a lot of my talks, actually. Um, I, I've had the chance to give quite a few uh, breakouts and keynotes at events. And I use this, this place. And there's this place I drive by every day on my way to work. In fact, it's, as I sit here, it's just down the road, right down here. And this place is immaculate, right? It's It's got pipe fence all the way around. It's got all the... All the fence lines are beautifully manicured. 
Um, it's got just incredible equipment. It's got an amazing head shoot. It's just beautiful, right? It, it lays so pretty. Um, as I remember, I, I know time and time again, there was a time I like, man, that place is so nice. I just, I find myself like, man, my place doesn't look that good or, you know what, you know, the things mm-hmm. that we do. And then one day it hit me, I was driving down the interstate and I was like, wow, this guy has an interstate running through his, right in front of his place, right? Like every, I mean, it's not just me looking at his place. It's everybody that comes back, comes down Interstate 44, which is a very busy road. You know, look at it constantly. It's always, always has eyes on it. You know, my place is back in the woods. I mean, nobody comes back there unless your family. Um, it's, so, to, to, to what I'm trying to say here with that is, again, would we really want to switch problems with somebody? Would we really want to change the way our lives are? How we, we take the way we live our lives for granted so much. Um, and again, I'm, I'm so guilty of this too. And that's, that I, I'm talking, I'm not talking at this like, this is the way you should do it. No, I, I should listen to my own advice because I'm the reason I talk about the things I do is because I'm guilty of them. Um, and I think for me, when I like, when I realized like, man, my, I, I would never trade places with this guy, no matter how great it looks and my, and it's not like my place looks bad. It doesn't looks great. Um, you know, we just have some older stuff around, which is fine. Um, but it, when I, I realized like, man, I would no, never, trade places with him because i would never want to have to uh have everybody looking at my my place all the time so i think that's like when we step back and are sort of super mindful of like our really our real intentions and what are we doing and what it takes and what our actual life allows us for us um yeah it's it's it, it it can make a big change um i lost my train there sorry um so yeah, I just try to remind myself of the of of what really matters and what re- I really get out of things. Um, and and not to keep running on this, but I, my wife and I we have we have a set of core values that we have for our family, for our relationship, and and I have them for my businesses too. And like, what are what do we want to get out of this business? Like, do I and it, do I want a business where everybody looks at it and, and, and thinks how immaculate it is? And eh, it doesn't really matter to me, but does it, do I w- have a place where I can do what I want and enjoy what I want and uh, not have the pressures and have freedom with, with some of my decisions? Yes, absolutely. So as you can tell, which one of these places fits into my, my core values, it's the place I have. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a long tangent answer to that, but, uh, um, that's, that's really how I can best define how, how to, how to get out of that trap is to really think about what really matters to you. Well, I appreciate that. And I mean, you said you made a lot of great points there, but I appreciate your core values because to me, that kind of goes back to well, what are you making it mean to yourself? Like, are, mm-hmm. are you hitting those core values? Like, are you making it mean that you're not hitting your core values? Well, then maybe change your core values if that's maybe it's time. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't be like wandering around aimlessly in it. We, we have to have some like we have to have some sort of purpose to why we're doing what we're doing. And that's not just that's with life in general. That's with every aspect of our life. Like, what do we we have to have a clear definition. What do we want to get out of this? How are we going to obtain that? You know, we have to have this roadmap. I mean, it can be very general, very sometimes vague, but you still have to have an idea or else Mm -hmm. you'll never accomplish what you want to. No, I agree. And I think that's like you just said, important with everything. I don't need to reiterate that. (laughs) You said it. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) So kind of broader scope because you deal with this mental health realm so much. I shouldn't say deal with, I'm trying, you work with this mental health area so much. If you could permanently change one thing about the rancher's mindset or mental health, 
what would it be? Yeah, I think it's where, like, what's the most important thing? I mean, I, I get there. Things have to be taken care of when they need to be taken care of. Like that is not lost on me. I've done a lot of hard work and realized there's a lot of work that that can't wait. But on my really early in the in fact, it might have been on the first episode of the podcast. I talked to Val Farmer, and Val Farmer is a clinical psychologist who has done this kind of work in ag mental health for a really long time. Um, and he said to me one time, like, we have to switch the relationship that the farm has to us. Uh, we, so many of us treat it as if it was our mistress. You know, we take away time from our family. We take, you know, we take away from things that are actually more important. And we sometimes spend too much time. If we spend too much time away from, you know, with it and not with our family, it, it this fissure begins to create that was a really bad way to say that you shouldn't spend any time with a mistress, <laughs> but we, the, you, you understand what I'm saying. Um, but, but instead of treating it like your mistress where it's almost like this guilt thing or, or you're, you're taking too much time, you need to treat it more like you would a baby where that baby needs nourishment, needs time. You know, there are certain times where that baby only needs you, but there, but gradually it's going to need, you can step away from it. And the, the, the baby can be more self-sufficient and self-sustaining. And that's kind of the way we have to see our operation in the same way. Like how many of us just spend all that time, spend all the free time, don't do anything away from it, um, make ourselves a slave to it, um, take away the family time from, and, and instead, uh, how, how it, could we change if we applied that same logic and giving it the nourishment it needs when it needs it. And sometimes that's a super busy job. Sometimes that's a lot. Uh, but there are times where you can step away from it too. And uh, man, that when he said that to me, that really changed my, my outlook on it. Because it was something I was struggling with and I struggled with for a really long time. And it, was, it, caused, some, um, it caused some friction in my marriage. And um, man, whenever I just really changed how I saw that, uh, it made a huge difference. Well, thank you for sharing that. So as we kind of wrap up today, do you have any resources that people can turn to if they are ready and wanting to make that change in their mindset or mental health? Yeah. So I've, I've got a, I've got a really a comprehensive list of of mental health resources on my on my page uh agstateofmind.com slash mental health resources um but you know i i i love to listen to i love to listen to podcasts i love to read books on this thing uh a couple of the books that have really been my go-to in this mindset thing have been uh uh, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins and uh, Atomic Habits by J James Clear. Both books, those books have, as far as, to, as far as resources that I apply on a daily basis, uh, those two, those two are the ones that I would probably cite that I use the most on, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, thank you very much for being on the show, Jason. It was great to have well, you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the time. Thank you again to our friends at Red Angus for sponsoring this episode. Value-added programs are on the rise in the beef industry. As input costs increase and margins remain tight, enterprising producers are exploring new ways to improve their return on investment and open doors to new marketing avenues. The Red Angus Feeder Calf Certification Program, the most mature value-added program in the beef industry, is expanding and helping more producers earn premiums on their calves. The FCCP combines three important components into a single value-added program, genetics, source, and age verification. Cattle producers recognize the value of the yellow FCCP tag and continue to see market-topping premiums for a minimal investment by enrolling their Red Angus sired calves. And for those producers who seek age and source verification but are lacking the Red Angus sired component, be sure to check out the Allied Access Program, which is 
is eligible to age and source verify every calf born in the U.S., regardless of breed. For more information on Red Angus value-added programs and the FCCP, please visit redangus.org. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.